Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our live Zoom webinar or the uh, recording thereof uh, on YouTube. We're going to be talking about the earthquake that happened this summer uh, near Sparta, North Carolina in August. Uh, magnitude five or so earthquake, something that doesn't happen very often on the East Coast. Uh, some people might remember the one that happened, oh, not quite 10 years ago, I think it is, uh, the Mineral Virginia earthquake that knocked bricks off buildings in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so now and then we do get some significant earthquakes, sometimes damaging earthquakes here on the East Coast, but they're not something that we often think of. Uh, there actually are a number of small seismic zones around the region. Uh, so we're going to learn some more about this event and the kinds of research that can be done to learn how these things work, maybe learn better how often some of these earthquakes can happen and where they can happen. And a little bit about earth science as a career path. And there'll be some time for question and answer. I, I'd like to draw your attention if you're on uh, live in Zoom, there's a Q&A button. And so we can post questions, any of the audience can post questions in there as we go through. And, uh, and we'll have a time to go through those. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> We also have, just, uh, just to welcome people again, uh, we have our presenter, uh, Jesse Hill uh, from the North Carolina Geological Survey. And we also have a variety of participants from various places. Of course, we have a few here from Concord University. Uh, we've induced a number of students uh, to participate through a class uh, assignments, as this is a really good learning opportunity. And we have uh, several high school, middle school classes that, were that are tuning in uh, from various high schools around West Virginia and some other places as well. Uh, we have a resident of the town of Sparta where the earthquake happened who's actually signed up for, uh, to participate. Uh, so this is all great. So again, uh, so welcome, let's say welcome to Jesse Hill and I'll hand uh, everything over and let him start the presentation. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Keene. And I am really excited to be here. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. So um, uh, as, I'm, as, as was just alluded to, I'm gonna be talking about this recent earthquake in Sparta, North Carolina and I'll be focusing on something we're calling the Little River Fault. But we'll get into all those details later in the talk. So kind of where we're going, where I'm gonna go with this, I'm gonna do a little bit of introduction on earthquakes, tectonic plates, and how they uh, move along faults. Um, I'll give a little bit of background on earthquakes in the region. I'll give some examples of some of the damage that happened around Sparta, North Carolina. And the bulk of the talk is going to focus on the Little River Fault and some of our field and drone mapping that we did to, uh, uh, to figure out where this thing is. And uh, I'll, I'll show some other examples of some other young faults that crossed the North Carolina Blue Ridge and how these are not totally unprecedented, although this was the first surface rupture we've ever seen. And I'll conclude with kind of talking about what do I do from day to day and some of our future work with this project? So showing here a, a worldwide map and this, uh, this shows earthquakes and tectonic plate boundaries. And what I wanna draw your attention to is where the earthquakes are occurring. And you can see that most of the earthquakes and this, this is just over the past year. So I made this map yesterday. So over the past year, these are all of the earthquakes worldwide greater than magnitude 5.1, which is what we saw in Sparta. You see most of the earthquakes are happening along these plate boundaries where plates are colliding into each other, or they're pulling away from each other, or they're, they're sliding past each other along fault zones. But we do have some, such as our lonely uh, little Sparta earthquake right here in the middle of the North American plate. And there are some other instances of plates uh, or earthquakes within the plate, what we call intraplate earthquakes. But for the most part, earthquakes tend to happen at the plate margins due to interaction of those plates. So when we have some, 
something in the middle of the plate, we know that that's something a little bit odd going on. I want to define a couple of terms here that I'm going to be using a lot. In, um, so I'm a, uh, my background is in structural geology. And as a structural geologist, what I try and figure out is how, when, and why did the Earth change shape? And one of the ways we do that is we look at the orientation of different planar features and some linear features. But I'll be talking about a lot of planar features in this talk. And I'll, I'll, as geologists, we describe things using strike and dip and dip direction. So I just want to make sure everyone knows what those mean so that you're not lost throughout the talk. A strike direction is essentially a horizontal line on a plane. Imagine this compass rose here is pointing north. So this is a north strike line. It's dipping 45 degrees off to the east. So as structural geologists, we want to measure the orientation of these things, and we want to ask ourselves, how did they get oriented that way? I will be talking about a reverse fault, and there's some other a couple of vocab pieces of vocabulary you need to know. So a reverse fault is essentially caused by a horizontal compressional stress, and the effect is a horizontal shortening and a vertical growth. This is one way we can we can uplift mountains or we can grow topography. And as as you can see in this simple block diagram, we have what's called a hanging wall and a foot wall. When the when the crust gets shortened, the hanging wall goes up the fault plane and the foot wall goes down relative to the, the, the fault plane. So you'll see these abbreviated as HW and FW in the rest of the talk. And um, structural geology, like I said here, is a game of cause and effect. So we're going to be teasing out some of the effect by looking at the causes. Um, okay, so um, the Appalachian Mountains were formed from a, a northwest directed plate motion and collision. And as you can see, there's this high topography going from the southwest to the northeast. And this was formed um, when the plates were colliding together over 200 million years ago. And this would have been an active plate margin during that time. And now we're right in the middle of the plate. But uh, a lot of that collision on a, on a simple level formed a lot of southeast dipping faults. So we, we see a regional trend or a regional a fabric of faults dipping off to the southeast from that northwest directed compression. So that's important to lay the framework of what are most of our Appalachian uh, mountains. We do know that there are some other, there have been other big intraplate earthquakes in the eastern U.S. These images and this map are from um, 1886. Uh, well, the map's not from 1886. It's it's derived from old observations, and this was these are the intensity of shaking away from Charleston, South Carolina. Now, this was a very big earthquake. It was estimated to be between 6.9 and 7.3 in magnitude, an intensity of 10. So that's the highest intensity of shaking that we can see. It caused uh, five to six million dollars in damage, which today would have been about 160 million dollars and it uh, produced at least 60 fatalities. And you can see it deflected this railroad track in the sepia image in the middle of the slide here. So in North Carolina, about 100 years ago, there was the Skyland earthquake. And this was estimated to be a magnitude 5.2. And it also had a pretty wide range of, of shaking. So that's also in the Blue Ridge in North Carolina. About um, 10 years ago, as Dr. Keene mentioned earlier, there was the Mineral Virginia quake. And this was uh, in 2011, it was a magnitude 5.8, intensity of eight. And this caused uh, damage to uh, Washington DC area and other, uh, uh, other, other buildings up there. It, it was felt really in a, in a wide way. And I, want, I, I think this map is interesting here because a similar magnitude, uh, even a greater magnitude, 6.0 in central California is felt in a much smaller area. So perhaps we feel these um, events in the east because the rocks are older and colder and the seismic waves travel differently. And then this brings us to our recent earthquake in Sparta in 2020. And what we're looking at here is a, a map showing um, responses from USGS's Did You Feel It website. 
And this is a website where you can record your uh, responses. And there were over 100,000 um, crowdsourced responses. And it, it seems like there were more of them to the south. But you can see it's a pretty broad area that it was felt. It's a magnitude 5.1 and is intensity of 6. So that's um, you know strong shaking with some light damage. There were, there, luckily, there were no fatalities or serious injuries. Um, there were five foreshocks, and there have been um, over 200 aftershocks. In fact, there were uh, just five of them uh, a couple days ago. So we have some earthquakes. Uh, the, the earthquakes are not just evenly distributed in the east. We have, we have some active seismic zones, such as the central Virginia seismic zone, which is where that mineral quake was. We've got the Eastern Tennessee seismic zone, which is very active. And then we've got the Giles County seismic zone. This Sparta may be part of that Giles County seismic zone. But we know that they don't seem to be randomly placed. They seem to be in these concentrated zones. There even are some up in West Virginia. So this um, shows earthquakes from the USGS database going back to 1901. And through um, this year, it's about 1,500 quakes they've got. And I just want to show this because it, it, it's not completely unheard of that we would, we would have seismic activity. On the right here, we've got the, the 200 or so events in Sparta. And this red line is showing what we're calling the Little River Fault. And you'll see that abbreviated as LRF throughout this talk. And this star is basically where the main event was, that 5.1 event. I want to point out that a lot of these aftershocks were less than 0.5 magnitude. So a lot of sh smaller ones, and um, but there were over, over 200 aftershocks. Now, this map on the left is from the Allegheny County Emergency Management, and it shows uh, locations of uh, known damaged buildings or other infrastructure. And as far as we know, all of this damage happened during the 5.1 earthquake. Uh, there may have been some minor damage in the aftershocks, but the majority of this happened during that main event. The Little River Fault is outlined in this blue box, and it's not one continuous fault plane, like I showed in that block diagram, but it's rather, it's a fault zone. It's a east-southeast striking fault zone of many different fault strands. We were able to map out deformation for about two and a half kilometers. And parts of it are parallel to these uh, linear stretches of the Little River. Uh, we, we thought about calling it the Sparta Fault, but there's already a Sparta Fault in Greece. So we went with the Little River Fault. This is the, the same um, extent, but with the aerial image. And the, the Little River Fault zone crosses uh, paved areas, forested areas, and agricultural fields. And we see different surface, we see different deformation based on the surface material and where in each of these fault strands uh, you are. This map right here I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk in some of the slides. And you'll see a little yellow star to show you where you are on this map. We're going to kind of work our way from the west to the east throughout and show some field examples of what we mapped. There were uh, a lot of a lot of damage. There's a lot of damage in Sparta. It was uh, estimated somewhere greater than $15 million damage. There were a lot of down chimneys. Um, and luckily, nobody got hurt. You can imagine what would happen if one of these fell on somebody. Uh, a lot of cracked chimneys, twisted chimneys. We saw a lot of down chimneys. There were um, damaged foundations as well. So this is the, the VFW building. This is a really important uh, building for the people of Sparta. It sort of serves as a community center of sorts for, for, for many people there. So they had some pretty significant damage to their foundation there. And um, some of the, the other, other buildings that were damaged, just, you can see that some of the blocks moved along mortar joints and some of them broke all the way through. A lot of masonry damage in Sparta. There were shifted and toppled gravestones um, a lot of the gravestones move to the north and to the east. So my compass here, the black end of my compass is pointing pointing off to the north there. And we saw a pretty consistent pattern with gravestones shifting and toppling to the northeast. Once again, compass is pointing off to the, the north there. So we saw 
shifting off to the off to the east, shifting off to the east, and uh, toppling over to the east. There, a lot of north, a lot of northeast motion. Our initial mapping, we were just looking at um, cracks in the road and cracks in um, fill, and we we you can see there's a little bit of offset in this these paint layers, but most of these are extensional features. Um, at the geological at the North Carolina Geological Survey, my job is a landslide. Um, I'm a landslide mapper. So one of the things we were doing is we were trying to determine are any of these extensional ruptures producing any uh, potential landslide hazards. And um, so that was our, our initial goal was to map out where's the damage, are there any places at risk of future slope failure. As we, we went forward, we started to see some things that didn't just fit with those extensional cracks or landsliding, such as shortening structures. Now this is where a water, my, a water main broke, and you can see that the pavement has been pushed up into what we call a chevron fold, so it made a really nice fold in the pavement here. Over on the right, this is where the asphalt has thrust over top of the concrete sidewalk here. So these are um, consistent with something else going on. That previous image of the asphalt uh, thrust over is right here in the center of this big map. And going across the map, there was a fault scarp. It was an east-southeast striking fault scarp across the parking lot. And we were, we were able to measure um, about 20 centimeters of vertical offset. And if you look at this line along the top of the building, there's a pretty big bend in it right where that fault scarp reaches. So we, we pulled some strings and some used some laser levels and other techniques, and we were able to measure about 22 centimeters of bend where the fault scarp intersects the building. So um, here we've got our hanging wall and our foot wall, and we think this is north-northeast motion. So this this block on the left has moved over to the right across this block on the right and we had uh, about 20 centimeters of vertical dis displacement there. So remember this this block here so basically what we're seeing is that hanging wall pushing up over top of the the foot wall there. But we always want to test our idea as a scientist so we said well what if this isn't a normal or uh, a reverse fault but this is a normal fault where now this is the hanging wall and the fault plane is dipping off to the north northeast and this is just a big slide block that could also produce this type of uh, surface this surface scarp so to test that idea what we did is we dug a trench so this is uh, I'll go back here right around the corner behind this dumpster along the trace of this fault if you can imagine that goes through the corner of the building now we're looking right along this trench and this is the surface exposure of the fault now this is the first time an earthquake has ever been documented to produce a surface rupture in the eastern U.S. Uh, to our knowledge. So we were lucky because there was a underneath the gravel there was a, a synthetic cloth layer that preserved this fault book, this fault geometry. And there's I'm, I'm pointing at the, the hanging wall there, and the fault plane is actually dipping off behind me here. And looking at the same same trench. Um, this is the, the, the fault scarp, and it's only a couple centimeters of vertical offset there because we're near what's called the fault tip. So one of these individual faults is, is pinching off right here. But we were able to confirm that, yes, this was north-northeast motion that produced a, a hanging wall thrusting up over top of the foot wall here. Another thing we noticed was this building behind the fault trace there was this crinkling or wrinkling of the sheet metal paneling. So that helped confirm the, the idea that this was north-northeast motion. And so what you this is a north-south stretch of the, the building right here. And essentially you had north-south shortening that caused this what we call a crenulation fabric. Or you might see this in metamorphic rocks that have been refolded. And so essentially these are folds that formed because this section of the building got a little bit shorter. So looking, looking at the trench, um, we want to look for offset in what we call marker layers. So there is a uh, fill layer that's underlaid by this red clay layer. I'm going to highlight it here. And we were able to measure somewhere in the order of 10 to 12 centimeters horizontal offset. And right here, like I said earlier, we're near the fault tip. So uh, we didn't have the 20 centimeters of vertical displacement here. But we were able to confirm that this was a 
a reverse fault and had, had broke the surface. It, um, there was evidence in the same trench that this fault had moved previously. So we saw things like fault gouge, which is essentially a, a clay that's formed during the motion of a, a fault. And it, it was an older fault gouge, so it pre-existed this motion. And then we saw a fault breccia. So I'm, I'm highlighting with these white dots, these chunks of fault gouge and other lithic fragments that got caught up in this fault zone. So essentially you're moving this hanging wall this direction and you're churning this foot wall material and you're um, so this is evidence that this was not the first time the little river fault moved the timing of that previous motion we don't know but that's something we're still actively working on now we're looking at the fault plane itself so these black this black surface is made of manganese coating we call uh, and, and these grooves that were in the, the fault plane are what we call slicken lines. And essentially, these are recording the slip direction of the fault. And they were what we call dip slip motion. So if you remember your strike and your dip, your dip is going straight down the, the angle of incline. And so this, this um, motion on this fault reflected previous uh, dip slip reverse motion with a, a minor right lateral or a minor horizontal component to it, but mostly dip slip off to the northeast. I don't think that these slicken lines formed the day of the fall. We did see other very similar features uh, within the hanging wall that didn't uh, break the surface. I think these are older slicken lines. Again, the same trench again. Um, there were these ductile shear bands. So there was a, a period of, where this fault actually probably moved ductally or it flowed rather than break rather than breaking and there were offset of these ductal flow bands uh, in consistent with the um, north northeast motion uh, I, I don't think these were um, formed in august i think these are older events as well okay so we were just looking at this area right here where this trench where we dug the trench. And this is a image showing slope. So the, the bluer colors are flatter, the greener colors are steeper. And the way this was made is with what's called a UAS or a unpiloted aerial system, or you may have heard of it called a drone. Okay, so we flew it. So a UAS in, is the whole, the whole system. So the, the pilot, the, every, the whole system is what we call a UAS. So this is a UAS derived image, and it's it's after the quake. And so these uh, lighter colors are the fault strands. So it's not one continuous fault strand. And these uh, profiles are what we see. So if we're going from B to B prime as we go uh, downhill this way, we, we see somewhere in the order of 10 to 12 centimeters. So that's fa fairly consistent with, with the 20 centimeters we measured over here in the middle of this fault strand. And it's, it's what we call an n echelon pattern. So rather than one continuous pattern, they're sort of steps. And this, this continued uh, in other parts throughout the fault zone. So uh, we're, we're moving on a little bit to the east. So now we're sort of in closer to the center of the Little River Fault Zone. And this is where that water main broke along what's called River's Edge Road. And this photo was taken by one of the local homeowners. And so w this is the only photo we have of this uh, before any, we, before we saw it or anybody else took any pictures, this was, uh, this was flattened and um, uh, gravel was, uh, they put uh, gravel down. But anyway, it shows that the, 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 the direction of this folding is consistent with a north-northeast motion. So we're looking sort of down to the south-southwest and this hanging wall thrust over top of the foot wall. Uh, same location, but after they fixed the road. So they've, uh, there was a vertical displacement here um, that continued through the grass. It wasn't as drastic as what we saw on the pavement, but um, it was definitely noticeable. And so we dug another trench here. So this, this pile of dirt right here is the same pile of dirt you see so our, our, the red dashed line show the, the fault 
surface trace. And this was a little bit different um, than what we saw previously, where it was a fault that was breaking weathered bedrock material. The material here, the, the top brown layers, we call a colluvium. So essentially, this is material that's got uh, pebbles and cobbles and boulders in it, and it's moved uh, downhill over time. And underneath it is a, 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 we call a saprolite, which is a word for very, very weathered rock that almost isn't rock anymore. And it was derived from an amphibolite. So it's type of metamorphic rock that turned into this red clay. And there, there were no mappable offset of these layers. So here we're seeing surface flexure, but not surface rupture. So we think this is above what's called a blind fault. And just to, to figure out where we are, so we're just looking at trench two over here. Now on the, the left, I'm showing a pre-earthquake LIDAR surface model. And so LIDAR is essentially, it's like radar with lasers. So they would have flown this from a plane and they shoot millions of lasers down at the surface and record when those return. And then they can process, process that into a very high resolution digital elevation model or digital surface model. So uh, this was pre-quake here, and this is post-quake over here. And um, let's see, let's, this is post-quake here. And so we're seeing the, the, the surface rupture come right through here. And now the elevation profile, which was pulled off of the post-quake digital surface model, shows a similar about 20 centimeters of offset. Some of our working partners have since done ground penetrating radar where they actually uh, drive what looks like a fancy lawnmower over top of this and they were able to image the fault underneath here. So we hope to dig some more trenches within this field and a little bit further to the east eventually. Um, so this is supposed to be animated and I guess my Gift doesn't seem to be playing here. So we did find another rupture going through here. Uh, so I apologize that that's not animating. But we, we found another rupture running right through here. And um, here's, here's some images of it. So this, this actually did rupture. So this wasn't just flexure. So we, we're, we want to dig another trench here. And we, we're seeing about a 20 centimeters vertical offset. So the Little River Fault, it seems like it made parts of the crust 20 centimeters higher. So going back to how do we build mountains through these compressional events? Well, this is a one way you do this incrementally over a long, long period of time is through this reverse faulting. And we want, like I said, we want to dig another trench here because um, we think this will be a good place to see the actual fault rupture. Okay, so This is the image I showed earlier. And these are all of the earthquakes that are, um, that have been recorded around Sparta. And so our green dots show our greater than 0.5 magnitude. And here's, here's our shake damage. Just to recap, th this was estimated to be at about 7.6 kilometers depth by the USGS. So the, the question is, did this fault at the surface, did it, is it the same structure that moved at seven and a half kilometers depth? That would be fairly extraordinary for something as, although 5.1 is, is moderate in size, it's not quite big enough to cause a rupture from seven and a half kilometers depth all the way up to the surface. So there might be something else going on there. So the, these block diagrams show um, a projection of the Little River Fault, which is drawn in red, down into the crust. So we're looking at about the bottom of the box here, something like 13 kilometers depth. And this here, this large sphere, and all of these spheres are the, the earthquakes, not just in two dimensions like we were looking at here, but we're looking at in, in three dimensions. So they're, they're based on how the, the size of the sphere, it says how big it is. So this is our, our 5.1 event. 
and it's 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 further below the surface uh, of the projection of that fault trace. Um, so here's looking off to the uh, looking off to the west here, and we see our, our 5.1 event is way down here. A lot of our aftershocks are further up. But if we just take the limited data we have at the surface and project it straight down, it probably doesn't go straight down this far. But what this test shows us is that there's not a direct connection between the 5.1 event, if it's seven and a half kilometers depth, and what we see at the surface. So a couple of ways you might explain that is to say, well, what moved down here caused something else to move up here. Or maybe it wasn't seven and a half kilometers depth. And we're still trying to resolve that, um, that discrepancy. Now this image over on the right is what's called a focal mechanism, or sometimes you'll hear them called beach balls. And I'm not gonna get into too much of this, but basically what we wanna see here is that one of the nodal planes or one of the estimated fault planes that the USGS predicted moved was this one, and it's dipping off to the northeast, which is the opposite direction of what, what we're seeing here. Now, this one would have been a north-south motion, so that doesn't really match the strike either. So there's some type of mismatch, and we're still trying to work out what that mismatch is. But what we can say is that the south-southwest dip of the Little River Fault is opposite of the, the estimate from the focal mechanism. There's something else going on at the depth and the surface. I think it's probably that you had some secondary motion of a of a, of a, a, surf, a fault closer to, to the surface. All right, so there are some other young faults crossing the North Carolina Blue Ridge. So even though this is the uh, first documented surface structure, we know that there are some other we call post-orogenic. So on, on Orogenic is referring to a mountain building event. So these are families of structures that happen, they, they, they formed after all of the other Appalachian mountain building events. And we, we, we see a lot of those as east, southeast, the west, northwest, east, west, and north, south lineaments or big topographic trenches that cut across the mountain belt. And we see the Boone Fault, the Mills Gap Fault, or some other ones we know are, are Cenozoic or, or very late uh, structures relative to the Appalachian Mountains. And some of these origin crossing lineaments, they have minor faults and ab abundant vertical joints. And I've spent a lot of my time in grad school and at the survey trying to figure out how do these cross structures uh, relate to topography. So I'll go into that a little bit. So this is the uh, blank, oops, this is the uh, the digital elevation model of the, the mountain range and we've got this northeast to uh, southwest trend and all of these cross structures and I like showing this with and without the line so you can see yourself see for yourself there's some pretty major linear features cutting through here and a lot of these we know are um, have some minor seismicity as well as um, a lot of fractures and a lot of faults And Sparta is along, along, along one of those, a minor one. And it's not too far north from what we call the Boone Fault. And the Boone Fault is something that, uh, it's, it's something I mapped during my, uh, when I was in grad school. And it's, it cuts across the Linville Falls Fault Zone. And it's part of this big lineament swarm here. So I'm gonna step back one more just to, oops, let me show here. Step forward one more. Um, this, it has these blue dots are earthquakes. So there were some earthquakes right along the Boone, Boone Fault um, in 2013 and 2014. So we, we, we have documented another fault zone we think is similar in orientation and similar, um, these were twos and uh, uh, twos and threes magnitude. So smaller, but still seismically active. This scoop right here is called the deep gap reentrant and the, the, where the Boone Fault intersects the, the Blue Ridge Escarpment as shown in this blue line, there are abundant landslides. So this was, these landslides uh, were mapped by the, the North Carolina Geological Survey in a previous project before I was here, but there is a concentration of landslides within the Deep Gap Reentrant. So we think that these young faults are inter interacting with the Blue Ridge Escarpment, causing slope instability um, and potential hazards. So um, 
we definitely think that the more we know about these faults, the better, the more we'll understand the topography, the more we'll understand the, the risk to the general population. So, um, let's see, I'm doing pretty good on check my time. Okay, so what might have caused our young faults in North Carolina? One explanation could be what we call erosional unroofing. So as, as the surface is breaking down and streams are removing the material, you're essentially making that part of the crust lighter and it can pop back up in response. So perhaps uh, that contributes to it. Uh, we've got some very complicated drainage networks or the river networks. They're capturing each other's headwaters and they're competing for drainage area. And as that happens, you get some really interesting erosional effects and, and uh, perhaps you had some popping up from that. One uh, explanation could be that we have what we call lithospheric delamination. So the lithosphere is essentially the crust in the very, very upper mantle. And it's the, the hard plate that's moving around on those tectonic plates. And when we produce the mountains, they, they grow by shortening, by lifting up, but they also grow underneath as a thick mountain root. So similar to an iceberg analogy, where if you've got just the tip of the iceberg showing up, so our mountains are the same thing. The topography we see is just the tip of the mountains. The, there's a lot deeper mountains underground, the lithospheric root. So that could be falling apart. When that falls apart, it essentially lets the crust pop back up. And some of this may be driven by a north-northeast-southwest shortening. That, that's a, the current um, horizontal maximum stress state is consistent with this shortening direction. So to wrap up, what is the Little River Fault? Um, some of the things I want to you take away from this. This is the first time we've documented a surface rupture of a modern fault in the southeast U.S. Um, it's a east-southeast striking um, fault zone that was reactivated. So there, there was abundant field evidence that shows that this was not the first time this fault moved, although it, it is the first time it's moved in, in any historical record. Um, there, sometimes there's a real mismatch between the time scales that we live our lives on and the time scales that the, the earth uh, changes. So it's, it's really interesting to, to see that, um, that this is not a, um, a brand new fault, although this motion was new. It's a reverse fault and it, it dips off to the south southwest and it's a series of fault strands. And it's consistent with a little bit of right lateral motion, which makes those in echelon steps. So a little bit of sideways motion, but basically dip slip motion. It produced some rupture and some flexure above a blind fault. So it's just an example of how that block diagram I showed you with, with the very clean fault plane, that doesn't really happen. Normally what we see are these series of complicated fault zones um, with different deformation along the fault zone. There was more shaking to the south-southwest um, based on the did you feel it reports. And perhaps that had something to do with that is where the, the hanging wall was. Perhaps it had something to do with those earthquake waves propagate through the, the Blue Ridge and the Piedmont in a different way than they do through the Valley and Ridge and the, the Appalachian Plateau. I'm not exactly sure why that shaking was asymmetrical. Uh, it's the, the trace is parallel to a uh, topographic lineament or one of these cross structures. And so perhaps if we, this is a reactivated fault zone, uh, so that lineament may be the result of previous fault motion. It crosses the northeast southwest structural grain of the southern Appalachians. So this doesn't fit um, as an older fault that just reactivated. It's, it's not just one of those older collisional faults that were formed over 200 million years ago when the Appalachians were building into the scale of an Andean mountain range. So it's essentially a young fault in an old mountain belt. And it's not the only one. We, we saw some of those, we see some of those other ones. So what we're still working on here, um, we're continuing our field mapping. We, we think that based on how big the event was, how long the fault zone, um, that's probably about the extent. We don't predict that we would see any recent motion much further than our two and a half to three kilometer long fault zone. 
we we're looking at de in some details at the, the damage to infrastructure and see what that tells us about shaking directions. Um, that may help us understand how things moved and what direction they moved. But um, we want to, the, the ball is rolling on getting a post quake LIDAR flight. So the UAS derived digital surface models we made are great because we can get them within a few days of flying it, but uh, it's a limited area. So we're going to get the, the entire area flown with LIDAR again. So that'll give us a, a good way to really see how much of the, the crust moved and where did it move. We're gonna do some more trenches and uh, that's sort of pending some other shallow geophysical studies that some of our research partners are, are heading up. And we wanna do some analysis of the streams and um, the other geomorphic um, patterns that may help us see signs of a possible faulting. And we, uh, one, of the, one of the big questions is recurrence interval. So uh, I don't have that right now, but it, hopefully we'll figure that out in the future um, because we may never see something like this again in our lifetime. We, it may happen today. We, we don't know about these things, but um, we want to try and determine a recurrence interval. Okay, so I'm going to hop away a little bit from Sparta, and I'm going to spend the last uh, few minutes here just talking about uh, what I do at the Geological Survey. So at the North Carolina Geological Survey, um, I'm a geohazards geologist. Most of what I do is landslide mapping, and I really like it. I, I love my job. absolutely like it. I've been, been on board for about 18 months. Um, this is my first uh, geology career position, um, but I, I'm, I love it every day. I'm super happy to be here. So what, one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is flying the drone. So as you can see in this upper image here, I'm flying the drone over a pretty big uh, landslide in Polk County here. Um, I, I've, th I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm standing on the track of a recent debris flow. And so a lot of our, our mapping is with slides, but it's also with these channelized landslides or debris flows. And here I'm, I'm sitting here working on my field computer, which is one of the things I really like. We take a full blown computer and we, we do all kinds of cool mapping right there in the, in the digital realm, in the, in the field. And these rocks in front of me here, these are not, this is not bedrock. These are loose rocks that have moved down the hill. So I just love this picture because it shows you know, how big some of these boulders really are. When we think about a boulder, we often think something, you know, you see in your yard, but these are house size, building size boulders. And I just want to point out, like, I'm outside all the time. I love it. So um, for, for someone who, who enjoys being outside, geosciences was a perfect career for me, where we're doing cool technology with, with drones and field mapping on computers, and but we're hiking and we're really investigating fun questions. And I, I just love it so much. Um, so, you know, we go out uh, in rain or shine sometimes, um, but that's fine. I, I, I love it. Um, we've got some monitoring stations here. So here we're, we're updating a, uh, a service panel. So th this is a, there's a rain gauge behind us, and we're actually actively monitoring some big landslides to see, are they moving? Um, we do some ur uh, urgent and emergency responses. So these are in the Nantahala Gorge. There were some pretty big debris flows. Uh, in, in 2019 that we, we mapped. And I, I enjoy being part of that as well. So I'm just as happy as I can be to be a field geologist. And it's something I always knew I wanted to do. I just didn't know it was a thing until I knew it was a thing and I knew it was my thing. So, um, okay, let's see. Now things obviously changed with COVID-19. Um, so these images, these, these images here, you see we're all, we're all masked up. And luckily, we're still able to work. Um, we, we never lost any work, so I'm grateful for that. We transitioned pretty easily into remote working because of the nature of our work, and a lot of our data are stored on remote servers anyway. But it makes things a little bit difficult, but we're still, we're still working. Um, so this is a, a quarry in, in Sparta, and you can see this is one of our um, work meetings out in the field, so we can still socially distance. And, um, this is a, a toe of a landslide here, so it's similar to the reverse fault, but this is just the slide going over top of this. Uh, okay, so 
Let's see. Okay, so I just want to say thanks to Dr. Keene and for Concord University for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk about geology. Um, this project has had a lot of lot of partners in it. So as soon as this happened, we jumped right in with uh, here at the state survey, but we partnered with North Carolina State University, UNC Chapel Hill, with the USGS, and with the Virginia Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy. And so thanks to all these people who are on this slide here. Uh, science is definitely not a lone ranger adventure, and um, we, we, we couldn't do it without partnering up. So thanks to everybody who's helped. Thanks to uh, the people of Sparta. They were really, really helpful uh, letting us on land and um, super nice people. So it's a pleasure to work up there. Um, okay, with that, I, I think I'm all done here. So thanks for listening. And I'll take any questions you have. I, I'm going to stop my screen sharing so I can see the question list as well. But I think Dr. Keene is going to field the questions. So, yeah. So thanks, Jesse. That was a really great talk. Uh, we learned a lot about earthquakes in the area and a little bit about some landslides, too. <laughs> so if there, anybody has any questions, uh, we do have the, the Q&A. Uh, there's a little Q&A button. And ah, here we go. We got the first one just popped up. Uh, so do you think there could be strong earthquakes in West Virginia as well, uh, including maybe big ones? Well, um, let me, I'm actually going to show my screen again here. Uh, boo, 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 boo. I can find where to do that. Well, okay. So, I'm not seeing my screen share. Anyway, so there, there could be. Um, w yeah. There are some um, events in Western North Carolina. There, I don't know of any uh, greater than five magnitude, but it, it looks like um, it, it's always possible. The, the Appalachian Mountains, I like to think of them as they're, they're very old rocks, but parts of them are young mountains. We know there are so some of the highest topography we see in West Virginia is in the Appalachian Plateau. So it's a little different than what we, we see um, different else, elsewhere. So perhaps the Appalachian Plateau is higher because of some type of uplift or some type of delamination that could yield earthquakes. So it's, it's possible. I don't want to rule it out. We have another question. Uh, this one is about field work uh, in response to an event like this. Do you have to work quickly because people want to fix roads and homes? Uh, does this make your job harder? Oh yeah, it does. That's a, so that's a really good question. Um, and to illustrate that perfectly was that uh, the place at the River's Edge Road where there was that really nice structure and by the time we got out there, it was all flattened. We do have to work quickly, and um, it's it's kind of it's a it's a bittersweet reality because I enjoy getting out there and partnering up and just being right there in the moment of it, um, and we see that with our landslide responses as well. Um, but we want to work quickly, also from a hazard standpoint, because we want to know are there other things that are potentially dangerous to people as well. And that's something that comes into play with this earthquake response, as well as with our day-to-day -day landslide response. So um, it's, it's sort of shifting gears between our day-to-day -day work where we're doing these countywide inventories to uh, detailed responses. Um, so yeah, you want to work quickly, uh, but you, you don't want to, you don't want to miss the details. So that's a, uh, a balancing act there, I suppose. So yeah, excellent question. The next one. Um, what is the largest earthquake recorded in or around West Virginia? Uh, is there any evidence for major ancient earthquakes in the area? Oh, that's an excellent question. Well, we know that the, the mineral quake was a 5.8, so it's not an ancient one. In terms of ancient ones, it's, it's hard to know exactly how big they were. Um, I, I suppose if we want to go all the way down the geologic time scale, I would say 
the biggest ones that happened in West Virginia probably happened during the assembly of the mountain range back in the Paleozoic. And I don't know what, how big those were, but in terms of uh, old, but not ancient, there probably were some big ones there. I, I, Confess ignorance, I don't know the, the exact biggest one in, in uh, West Virginia, but uh, the, the, the mineral Virginia one was probably big enough where a lot of people felt it there. Really good question, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, not sure about the, the absolute magnitude there, though. Does anybody else have questions? Well, maybe I'll throw in one. Uh, the uh, the technique with the drones uh, for mapping the landscape that looks looks really interesting, and you can get uh, so much detail out of it. It's like how do, how do you go, exactly go about flying one of those drones around and and making that into a map that shows you the landscape? Oh, okay. So this is this is really cool. This is one of my favorite parts of what we do, and it's it's. Uh, so essentially the drone is collecting a lot of two dimensional images. And then what we do is uh, sometimes we'll do a manual flight where we're just trying to fly a, a grid pattern um, and, and um, we do it manually and just try and track where you, you catch, capture a bunch of two dimensional images. And sometimes we have a pre-programmed flight where we have a flight path. We'll tell the drone we hit, we hit go and it flies that flight path. But essentially, either way, we, we collect a lot of two-dimensional imagery, and then we plug it into our computer, and we run a program called Drone to Map, and it essentially is uh, synchronous with Esri products, and it um, what it does is it looks for common pixels in each of those images, and so it will take all of those images and stitch them together, and then the real wonderful thing is it takes all that two-dimensional imagery and it produces a three-dimensional surface. So with just one two-dimensional camera and a lot of photos, we can make detailed, very detailed three-dimensional surface models. And then to take it a step further, something we do with our landside mapping um, is we would fly multiple flights over time. So we can look at a landslide change shape over time. So that way we're really going from two-dimensional to three-dimensional to four, four-dimensional. So it, it's a pretty fun product, and we are uh, all the time figuring out new stuff. My coworker Corey Scheip, he's really spearheading a lot of our uh, those, those projects, and it it's really fun to be part of because it's always something new, and but it's become a major part of our field workflow, and it's a fairly affordable system um, once you get trained to use it and whatnot. But it opens up all kinds of doors. Um, it's really time traveling you know, with the, with the drone to get to that four dimensional mapping. Oh. We do have one more question that just popped up in the Q and A box. Uh, how far from a plate boundary can an earthquake be? Well, um, pretty far, <laughs> pretty far. Um, yeah, so it, let me see, I'll try and, let me try and share this again, I lost my, screen share earlier. Okay, so I hope hopefully you're seeing this PowerPoint here. So we know that, I mean, just to take Sparta, for example, we've got the, uh, it's right in the middle of it. So, um, you know, that's a, a long distance, you know, or that's going to be thousands of kilometers away there. We've got some that are right in the middle of the African plate as well. So, they don't have to be driven by the plates interacting with each other. The plate can sort of be changing through vertical changes, you know, so it, if something is dropping off from the bottom, that's going to make the whole thing move up. Um, so that could be one way to, to drive some of that intraplate activity. I think intraplate seismicity is a very interesting field that's wide open for, for good research, um, trying to figure out what's, what, what drives these things. And there's another one in the chat. How is it that older and colder rocks produce a longer range of feeling earthquakes? Ah, okay. So 
think about it this way. If I took a, a tennis ball and I threw it against a brick wall, it's going to bounce off differently than if I took that ball and I threw it against a sheet that was hanging up. Okay, so it's just, you've got this softer material. It's not going to shake quite the same. So essentially, it, it comes down to uh, be really technical, what's called bulk modulus, the compressibility of something. But you can think of it as just how hard is it? Um, so I think that's the, the general analogy there, um, that the rocks are just more stitched together. They're, they're older. They're just not as, not as fluid, um, not, as, not as flexible, I suppose. You know, we've got like, uh, like in a recording studio, the sound baffling they put around is like big squishy stuff that essentially is softer, absorbs the sound. Well, that appears to be the end of the questions. Uh, thanks everybody who, who typed in some, some questions. Uh, we got some really interesting things to talk about because of that. And uh, thanks, Jesse. That was that uh, uh, did a great job on on explaining some of these things. Uh, so we're glad that you all were able to join us. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks everyone for for having me and listening. And if anyone wants to uh, contact me, you can reach me at Jesse Hill at ncdenr.gov. And so if you want to uh, feel free to bounce any more questions off of me, if you want to. You know, copy of this or whatnot, just let me know. And thanks again, Dr. Keene, for inviting me.